Today I want to share with you from Galatians chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. Galatians chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. And the title of today's sermon is called, How Free Are We? How Free Are We? Ready? Let's read it together in one voice. Begin. Then 14 years later, I went back to Jerusalem again. This time with Barnabas and Titus came along too. I went there because God revealed to me that I should go. While I was there, I met privately with those considered to be leaders of the church and shared with them the message I had been preaching to the Gentiles. I wanted to make sure that we were in agreement for fear that my efforts had been wasted and I was running the race for nothing. And they supported me and did not even demand that my companion Titus be circumcised, though he was a Gentile. Even that question came up only because of some so-called Christians there, false ones, really, who were secretly brought in. They sneaked in to spy on us and take away the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. They wanted to enslave us and force us to follow their Jewish regulations. But we refused to give in to them for a single moment. We wanted to preserve the truth of the gospel message for you. In this passage, this is a letter that Paul, the apostle, disciple of Jesus, wrote to the churches, uh, Christians in, in the city of Galatia, region of Galatia. And in this passage, Paul makes a very, very interesting point. And that interesting point that he made is about the topic of freedom. And he mentions that there were false Christians who are not really Christians at all, who were there, who infiltrated, yes, who infiltrated the church. And they, and the reason why they were there, and here's the interesting point. Thank you so much. And the reason why they were there was because they wanted to take away the freedom, the freedom that they had in Jesus Christ. And the reason why this is very interesting is this. In this world, in this society, many people outside of the church, many non-Christians and non-believers, when they look upon the church and Christians, their first thought and their first idea and the impression they have is that Christianity really is very legalistic, a church with a lot of rules. Ultimately, what they're saying is, you know, if you're a Christian, there is no freedom. In Christianity, there is no freedom. You don't have the freedom to do a lot of things because it's a, it's a religion about rules and of do's and don'ts. But in this passage, Paul makes a very interesting point in that it is the world that is in fact that is taking away the freedom from people. More specifically, in this passage, it was the society, the, the rest of the world that, were, that are trying to take away the freedom that we have, that we all have in Jesus Christ. So before I continue, let's first talk, uh, think about and talk about what is freedom? What really is freedom? You know, I looked up on the dictionary and the official definition of freedom, and there were a few, but it's all similar. And they say the, the definition of freedom is the power to determine action without restraint. That means the ability to do things without someone trying to prevent you from doing things otherwise. With this defi definition in mind, let's really think about this. Do we really have freedom outside of Christ? Is there really freedom that exists outside of Christ? Maybe in this context, do we really have freedom, more freedom outside of the church? Let's think about this and see if this is really a true statement. When I think about society, actually this is the impression that I have of the society. Does society accept us? Will the society accept us even if we didn't dress a certain way, talk a certain way, or have certain education, or make certain amounts of money? I mean, we talked about this th this morning. Will society accept us even if we, you know, even if we dr didn't drive a certain car? The reality is that we live in a society that is most segregated, restrictive, and exclusive. We, when we really examine our lives, the society, our workplace, and what goes on around here, 
the reality is it is the secular world, people, society outside of church that is most segregated, most restrictive, and most exclusive, contrary to the definition of what a definition of freedom is. We are oftentimes segregated based upon education. We are segregated based upon our income. We're segregated based upon our appearance, race, and culture. If you really think about it, then we can, the final conclusion is really that society does not accept us for who we are. That how then can people, how then do people think that it is within the secular society outside of church that really has where people have freedom? And how can they say that it is within the church where people do not have freedom? When we truly look deep inside people's heart, a lot of things that people do and say, they do it. You know why? It is simply because we want to be accepted by our peers and our family. We really do not have the freedom that we think we have. Now, is that really freedom that people have? You know, I, I want to share with you several stories to illustrate this. You know, I've spoken over the past year and a half, actually, I met two people who really enjoy the hobby of biking. And they both told me a very similar story. And they said that they wanted to bike because they wanted to be healthy. But they didn't want to do it alone. So they did research on the internet. And they found a club where they met on, on weekends for bicycling. And these two people, who they, they don't know each other, it's a separate club, they both told me almost the exact same story. They bought each bought a very you know, cheap bike. And they went to the, uh, the meeting time in a place for, to go biking. And when they arrived, they were, both of them, they were, you know, as soon as they arrived, they were looked upon with a piercing look by the people that were there. When I say piercing look, it's not one of those pleasant looks. It's like one of those, like, you know, very, you know, devious, angry, kind of like, you know, why are you here type of look. And the reason why they received that type of look was because these people that came for the first time didn't have uh, the right type of bike. It was too cheap. And secondly, they were not wearing the right gear. Basically, they were saying that you cannot be part of our club. If you want to be part of us, you need to have an expensive bike. If you want to be part of our club, you need to dress a certain way. There's another story about a girl that I knew personally. And she told me this story a couple of years ago. One day, she visited Seoul, and she went to Myeongdong, the uh, Rodeo Drive, the fashion district of you know, Korea. And she went there, and while, as she was walking, she saw this beautiful white dress. And she said, you know what, I, I don't know whether I can afford it or not, but you know what, I want to see how it looks on me. So she went inside the store with the intention of wanting to try it on. But as soon as she walked in, the sales lady looked at her. Maybe it was the way she looked. Maybe it's the fact that maybe she didn't seem very rich. I don't know what the reasons were. But she said, I'm sorry, we don't have any clothes that will fit you. And this girl was not <laughs> overweight by any means. Another story. My wife has a wealthy aunt and uncle, pretty wealthy. They used to live in Gangnam, which is a, the most expensive area in, in Seoul. They lived in Gangnam, but you know, after a while, the husband retired. He, they decided, you know, you know we, we want to get away from the hustle and the bustle, the busy city life of Gangnam, and maybe you know, live, it, live outside of Seoul. And they decided to move to Kimpo, which is just outside of Seoul. And they really got a nice apartment at Kimpo, huge. We visited there at one time. But after living there for two years, they, they said, we're going to move back to Gangnam. And we asked them, why are you moving back to Gangnam? And they said, and they have a daughter. They have a daughter who just recently graduated from college, and she's working. She said, you know, when we used to live in Gangnam, we had a lot of proposals and requests from other people that we knew, coworkers and so forth, about people wanting to set up their son with our daughter. But ever since we moved to Kimpo, we didn't get a single one, single one request or proposal from people who wanted to set up their son with their daughter. So they said, you know what, for our daughter's sake, we're going to move back to Gangnam. Another story. My friend, Pastor Peter, you know him well, he spoke to us about two or, two or three times. He told me that when he went to college, I mean, when he went to high school in the States, he, it was hard for him to fit in because back then in the 1984, 85, there weren't that many Asians in America. And when he went to high school, he wanted to fit in so bad, but they would not, he could not fit in with those American Caucasian group. 
But the only way he realized that he could fit in was through sports. So he said he was determined that because he could not fit in, he was determined to fit in. So he tried everything he can to join the football team, which he did. But he said that until he became a football player, he just he could not fit in. He could not fit into that society. All over the world, people are divided by wealth, education. It is considered unacceptable, unacceptable to associate with someone of different education level, wealth, or even family line or name. When we watch television, we're constantly reminded that, you know what, unless you're thin and pretty, you will not fit in, even for boys. And that is why it is more and more acceptable nowadays for people to go and have plastic surgery. Now, with all these things that I just stated, I want to ask you again, do we really have freedom in this society? Like the people say or think that they do. People look at church and say, I don't want to go to church because church restricts my freedom. I want to live outside of church because outside of church, I want that freedom to do what I want to do. But do they really, outside of church, have the freedom that they, they really think they have? Even in our daily lives, think about the things that we do. Do we really have freedom? Or are we really controlled by our environment? Look at all the things that we do, all the decisions that we make. Oftentimes, it is controlled by the expectations of those around us at work, at home, and by our friends. Recently, I met, a, I met a guy, a very nice guy, a good man, married, and he just had his third child, a good man. I liked him personally. He, do, he drinks once in a while, but he doesn't like to drink. He doesn't like to get drunk, to, you know. But he says about a couple of times a month on weekends, he, ha, he goes out to bar and to go drinking. And the reason why he does that is because that's the only way he can really hang out with his friends or other people. Because that's what they do. And unless he did what they did, he would not be able to fit in. You know, when I look at stories like this, it is not uncommon. And when I see stories like this, I say to myself, is there really freedom in this society? Do they, do they really believe that what they have is freedom? But the reason why the society or the world labels and pegs Christ, uh, Christianity as those who do not have freedom is because they, their view of freedom is totally different than what real freedom is. You see, in the society, in the back, they don't think this way. They will not admit it. But their definition of freedom really is this, simply this. Liberty. Freedom to do what is wrong? The reality is the reason why people say the church, the Christianity, if you worship God, there is no freedom. The reason why they say that, the truth is because they believe that, you know what, if you go to church, we do not have the freedom to do what is wrong. But the Bible tells us that's not what freedom is. Freedom is not the liberty to do what is wrong. In fact, it is just the opposite. The Bible makes it very clear that the freedom really means having the ability, having the liberty, and having the choice to do what is good. And those of us who think otherwise, the reality is that if you, if we, if you do not believe that or see that, then the reality is that we are under the bondage of sin. If we do not live in freedom, where we have the freedom, the liberty to do what is right, then reality is then you know what? We are in bondage. We are in chains of sin. You know, just to classically, you know, illustrate that, illustrate this story, this point is years ago, and it was really amazing story. Years ago, this television program, uh, they went to prison to interview some inmates. And the reason being was because in prison, they found out that more people were doing drugs inside of prison than, those, than the people that were outside of prison. 
higher percentage, there were greater percentage of people doing drugs in prison than outside of prison. It's amazing, but it's really true. You know, it's so easy for them to buy drugs and sneak drugs in and pay off the guards. And so in really, inside a prison, if you have money, you can do whatever you want to do. So they went inside jail to see if that was true, and they, they were interviewing some inmates. And they were inter interviewing two, two inmates. They were black and white. They were both sharing a little cell, and they were interviewing them. And they were interviewing them, and they said, they said, you know, if only people knew how fun we were having inside of jail. And they went on to say that, you know, we do drugs, you know, whenever we want to do. And we say, you know what, you know, and he said, we have homosexual, you know, sex, you know, in our prison. And he says, man, if only people knew how much fun and how much freedom we have inside of jail. Obviously for you, when you hear this story, you probably have the same, if you imagine this, you know, put, you know, try to imagine that image you probably have the same reaction that I have, which is pretty disgusting. These two people inside of a cell, they're half naked, half stoned and wasted. And they're bragging to be, oh, look, we live such a free life. And my, one of my reactions to that was, this is so sad. How can these people actually believe that the life that they're living is actually free and good? You see, the reason why the society and the world think, looks at Christianity and say there's no freedom here is because they themselves do not realize that their lives are in bondage, not really in freedom. They are in bondage. What do you call someone who does drugs? Would you say that they are free? I wouldn't call them free. They're under bondage. What about those people who drink every day? Would you say that they are free? No, I would call them, I would say that they are under bondage. What about those people who cheat on their wives? Would you say lucky them, they're free to do whatever they want? No, I would call them sad. And ultimately, they're going to ruin their lives and their families' lives. You get the picture. Bible tells us that real freedom, Bible tells us that real freedom is having the strength is having the strength and freedom to do what is right and what is true. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Galatians 5.13 says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. You see, God makes it very clear that the freedom we have is not to do what is wrong, not to do whatever we want to do, but the freedom that we have is to do what is good and what is right. That is true freedom. And the reality is this, when you really think about it, most people in this world do not have that freedom. They're under the bondage of sin. They're under the bondage of the pressures of society. They're under the bondage of work. They have expectations that they have to meet, according to the, the expectations of their boss that they have to meet. They have to meet the expectations of their friends and society and the culture. They really do not have the freedom to do what is good and what is right. Let me explain to you what real freedom is. And there are three parts. Number one, real freedom is knowing the truth that sets us free. Number one, real freedom is knowing the truth. John chapter 8 verse 32 says, And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Just like the story that I told you about those two inmates, how can they actually believe that they're living a fun and free life? Being cooped up in little cell, being stoned and drugged half the time, and living a homosexual lifestyle in that, I mean, even to think about it just grosses me out. And yet, they're laughing and thinking that what they're doing is so free. You see, real freedom is knowing that it is much more important to be at home with a family than to be out drinking with friends. 
Real freedom is knowing that being sober is much better than being drunk. Real freedom is knowing that there is a God that created the universe than to think that we are God. Real freedom is knowing that we are more than just accidental creation, but that we are created by the Almighty God with purpose. Real freedom is knowing that we were created for more than just to simply live out this life on earth for pleasure, but we were created for something bigger and something more important. See, knowing those things is the true definition of freedom. Because that truth Having that truth, it sets us free. And real freedom, you have the truth. But you also need, in order to have real freedom, is to have courage to admit the things that are wrong and not do them. That's the second part of having real freedom, is having the courage to admit the things that, that are wrong and not do them. You know, when I met Christ at the age of 21, before then, my life was basically about going to parties and chasing after girls. Brother Ilbin mentioned that I was almost a professional dancer, and most of you laughed. You know, I wasn't always middle-aged. You know, at one time, I used to be their age, and I, was, I used to dress cool like them. <laughs> you know, not, you know, with shirt tucked underneath and, and so forth, and always wearing collared t-shirt. Before I met Christ, that was my thing. I used to go to parties. I used to go to drinking parties, even though, to be honest, I never liked drinking. But when I met God, God revealed to me how meaningless, and to be honest with you, how stupid my life was, the things that I was doing. That basically, that everything that I was doing, I was wasting time. But the great thing was, I was finally able to free myself from that lifestyle. See, before then, I couldn't. Number one, I didn't know any better. I didn't know that spending all weekends partying was really a waste of time. I didn't know that going out drinking and getting stoned was really just stupid and wasting time and life. But when I met God, God helped me to see the truth, and He set me free. But more than that, once God showed me the truth, God also gave me the strength to admit that this is wrong and not do them. And after that moment, I told my friends that I didn't want to waste my time doing those things. To be honest, I didn't tell them I don't want to waste my time with you. That's just rude. But when they asked me to do those things, I simply declined and say, said I didn't want to do them. You see, I was no longer afraid of not fitting in to the society. I was no longer afraid of saying no and maybe perhaps being rejected by society. I now had the courage to do what was right. I now had the courage. I was no longer afraid also to be judged by society. I was finally free, free to do what was right. See, that is freedom, knowing the truth, admitting what is wrong, and having the courage to do them. And lastly, real freedom is having the courage, I mean truth and courage, to not do what is wrong, but in the end, having the truth and the courage to do what is right. That is freedom. Galatians 5.13 says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. You see, that's what God said freedom is. Real freedom is having the truth and the courage to do what is good. What is that? Loving one another. That is freedom. You see, people that do not have freedom, they live their selfish, petty lives, indulging in sin, they think, oh man, I want to I wanna go drinking. Sometimes if I want to you know, sleep around with girls, I want to do that. Sometimes I just want to get drunk and wasted, I want to do that. I want to get drugs, I want to do that. Sometimes I don't want to help out with the house, I want to run away, I want to do that. They think that's what freedom is. But Bible says, no, 
people that think that way and live that way, they're the ones that are, who are actually in bondage. They don't know any better. They don't know the truth. And they don't have the courage and the strength to not do them and stop doing them. But the real freedom is having the truth and the courage to do what is good, which is to love others. Real freedom is having the truth and courage to live out our lives as God intended when He created us. You see, when God created us, He didn't create us simply for us to be born one day and then live about 70, 80 years and then die. You see, God didn't create, it, create us for us to be born one day, go to school for 20 plus years, college, graduate school, and then get a job and work for another 40, 50 years, Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday, 12, 14, 16 hours a day. And then at the age of 65, retire. And then after you retire, you have nothing to do, so you kind of die until you're about 80. You see, God did not create us for that. But for those of us who, are, who do not know freedom, that's what they do. You see, they don't know that that meaningless life is in reality that is bondage. True freedom is living our lives as God intended for us to live. You know, when I look at my life, before I met God, and I shared this with you many times, that I was on my way to being a college dropout with very little future. But standing here, and when I reflect on my life, and all the things, and think about all the things that I did, sometimes I can't believe the life that I led after I met God. A boy who was born in Korea, grew up in the States, barely graduated high school, almost dropped out of college. My, I'm no special. I don't have any special gifts or talents, anything that's extraordinary, considered extraordinary. And yet when I look at my life in obedience to God, when I look at my life that I led in freedom in Christ, Sometimes I can't believe it myself. This man standing here today, I've traveled. I traveled the world. I've been to, I've been to places where most people only dream about going or only, only have read about or saw it on television. In my, in, in my email box, I have emails from people from three different continents. I've shared Jesus with thousands of people. I preach to people inside prison in Mexico, to disabled children in Missouri, to elementary school kids in Vladivostok. I gave medical care to, to sick people in Jesus' name in, in Afghanistan. I've walked around the streets of London praying. I preached to the homeless people in Osaka. And I sang Christmas carols in the hillsides of Thailand. You see, this is the freedom that I found in Jesus Christ. Freedom to live out my life according to God's good and perfect will. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, the thief, and they're talking about the devil. The thief comes. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy us. But God said, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. You see, that is the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Freedom that we have from knowing the truth. The freedom that we have from the courage to do, admit what is wrong, and doing what is right. And freedom to live our lives, freely choose to live our lives according to the God's perfect will and plan for us. You see, that is true freedom. And I know that every one of us in this room, that we too can live out that rich and satisfying life according to God's great purpose for you. If we choose 
to live in freedom, true freedom. I pray that that will be so for all of you. Let us pray.